Father God, we thank you and we come before you today as we begin to look into your word here this morning, Lord Jesus. Would you captivate our hearts with it, Lord? Would you instill in us a hunger and a desire to be filled with your Holy Spirit? Lord, I just thank you for your word, which we can read, which we can study, which you correct and lead us through. And God, as we uh, would explore the topic of prayer this morning, would you ignite our hearts with a, with a passion to communicate with you. We thank you for these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So we've been in a sermon series. This is week three called The Tree and Its Fruit based out of the words of Jesus found in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 uh, through 45. And the concept of this sermon series is that God is placed, is growing us into trees that bear good fruit. And there are a few things that good fruit entails on a tree. First off, that fruit creates familiar fruit. An apple seed produces apples, an orange seed, oranges, an avocado pit, avocados. And so as believers in Jesus, what we are producing in our life is found in what is stored up within us. And Jesus' words, his challenge to us in Luke chapter 6, is that if you are storing up good things of him in you, that will be the fruit that you are producing. But if we look at the realities of our lives and we go, hey, some of this doesn't line up with what God is producing, then we need to have some cultivation of the soil of our life. Last week, we explored, how do I read the Bible? Where, where, how do I go about this? We spoke on big fancy words like eisegesis and exegesis, which basically means like, are you reading this for the context in which God wrote it? Or are you trying to just like jam this into your life and be like, I will conform this to, to make sense to me. And the appropriate way is to go, God, would you reveal the context of why this was written, who it was written to, and then would you demonstrate to me the underlying principle that I might live my life with as well. We believe that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, according to the author of Hebrews. And what that means is that as we read it and as we experience life, we can allow this Word to transform the thinking of our minds and the renewing of our hearts, not in a capacity of just transforming habits, but transforming the depth of our heart. If, if we are good at discipline, we might be able to discipline ourselves to do some habits or cut other habits out of our lives. But what we see through scripture and what we experience in life is that when information goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge, our hands follow our heart every single time. That's actually what Paul writes about in Romans 7, where he's like, I don't do what I want to do, but I do what I don't want to do. And he says all these convoluted things that basically boils down to this reality that our hands follow our heart, not our head. We can know how to do math and be terrible at finances. We can read books on how to love our spouse, but, our, but when we don't allow that information to seep into our heart, we don't know how to express it through our hands. By reading the Bible, what we do is we allow God's word to not just fill our minds, but to fill our hearts and transform the very way that we think, live, and act towards other people. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1 says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so I want to challenge you that as you read the scriptures, we don't just read it so that we can be smarter than the person sitting next to us in our pew, especially if that person's your spouse. It's not a competition with them. But that we want to read the scriptures to go, God, would you activate love through me? Would you fill not just my mind, but my heart with your love? That my hands might be an extension of those things. That reading the word of God is actually a building block of faith in our lives, and that uh, consistent and sustainable is better than sporadic and disjointed. That even if we're just reading a little bit each day, that those moments are a feast before the Lord. There have been seasons of my life where my Bible reading consists of me listening to my wife read a children's Bible story that's three sentences long to my kids because life was busy. And as she's reading them, I'm going, oh God, I just thank you that you were with Daniel in that lion's den. And then she sings the song. And I'm like, in the lion's den, den, den. I don't even know how the song goes. That's why I don't sing them to the kids. But we take these small moments 
And we can be thankful and appreciative for the word of God in shortness and in longness, depending on the season of life that we're in. But we see that we are to be constantly in the word. Maybe that's for a duration of length on a day, and maybe it is a quick moment with the Lord being like, hey, just checking in. Okay, I got this. I'm going to run with it. Thank you. Today, friends, we're going to be looking at the topic of prayer. How do I pray? Why do I pray? Developing healthy roots of prayer. Who, when, where, why, what, how, the five W's and the random H that always seems to insert itself in is the sixth wheel of this question. How do we pray? Why do we pray? Where should I pray? When should I pray? What do I pray for? If you're like me, maybe there's been moments in your prayer life where you drew like stick figure diagrams for the Lord of what you expected, wanted, and asked him to do. You're like, if you could just do figure A, um, and if figure A doesn't work for you, I've come up with plan B, and plan B is here. And if you could do um, either one of these, the Lord God Almighty, who I think I dictate through my prayers, that would be great. And sometimes we approach prayer in this way, and other times we're like, oh, maybe God doesn't really work like a genie that serves me, but uh, as the creator and master, I serve him. And we have moments where we go, oh, that changes and revolutionizes my prayer life, doesn't it? And so I want you to know that prayer is a progressive way of living out our faith. The first time you pray, you don't know it all. And, and probably, likely, the last time we pray, we still don't know it all. But along this journey of the first time we utter, oh God, would you help? To the utterances that we have all along the way, Lord, would you bring mercy? God, would you just make my kid not act like this? <laughs> to the prayers of God, I don't know what to do next. I don't know what to do for work. Or this is challenging, or this is going on, the pleas of our hearts, the, the, the things that we see on the news, and we go, God, I don't even know where to begin for prayer on a topic as significant as this. So, Lord, would you just, would you do something? I don't even know what. And in those moments, we're so thankful that we're not God, that we don't have to come up with the solutions. This morning, we're going to ask some of these questions and walk through some uh, opportunities and options for developing a life of prayer. Jesus modeled a life of prayer. Consistently throughout Scripture, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels that are about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, what you will find is that Jesus modeled his life on prayer. There was moments where he acted publicly, and then he would retreat privately. There was moments where he began by retreating privately to pray to his Father in heaven, and then would publicly move based on what was revealed to him during those times of prayer. And if we ask ourselves the questions that was famous in the 90s on every multicolored bracelet, WWJD, what would Jesus do? The answer is, he prayed. And he prayed often. And he prayed in such a way that he actually revealed his prayers to us through scripture in the Gospels. In fact, in the book of John, chapters 14, 15, and 16, you get to read one of the longer sections of Jesus speaking, and it is a prayer about you. And I am so excited whenever I read John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus is like, the Father in heaven and I are one because we're so tight. And then he's like, but you and I can also be one. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. And then he goes on to say, he's like, I pray for you regularly. And he's like, not only do I pray for you, and he's talking to his disciples, he goes, I pray for all those who are far off. Guess what? We're the far off ones. We're the ones who, after a couple uh, centuries and years, are the ones who look to Jesus, and we get to read the words of John 15 and go, Jesus was praying for me even then. And I'm encouraged by that, church. And so it, as I walk into moments of prayer, I'm like, Jesus, I'm so thankful that you prayed for me. Let me step into prayer. A prayer life that aligns with the heart of God. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. 
And we'll see here that this is during the ever long discord of Jesus' words, known often as the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to read verses uh, 5 down through, uh, we'll just go straight through 15. So if you have your Bibles with you, or you can open up the Pew Bible, or you can pull it up on your phone, we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Jesus says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrite, hip, hypocrite, hypocrites. Oh boy. Lord, let's start over. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive your sins. But if we do not forgive others, our sins will also not be forgiven. I'm sorry that I had to read that part. You just, you can't leave it out. But it's, you read it and then you're like, oh, it's rough. This is Jesus' discord and teaching on prayer to his church, friends. And he starts off by asking these questions, the who's, the what's, the where's, the when's, the why's, the how's. And his first thing is like, don't pray like a hypocrite. Don't pray like a hypocrite. Do you know what that means? Be authentic with the prayers that you speak. Be authentic with them. Have you ever read any of the Psalms out loud? This is one of my favorite practices to do when I step into my prayer closet, is to read a Psalm out loud. Because when you read it in your head, you just think of like a very old school Roman Catholic priest, maybe that's just my upbringing. <laughs> and it's like, O oh Lord, vindicate me from my enemies, for they assail me on all sides. Your righteousness is impressive beyond the nations. And that's how I read in my head. But when I read the Psalms out loud, there's an authenticity of emotion that comes out when you read out loud. It's like, oh God, vindicate me. My enemies assail me. I don't even know what assail means, but I assume it's not good. <laughs> And so when we begin to read these things out loud, what you find out is that the Psalms, which were prayers and songs written by David and a few other authors, are these heartfelt, authentic moments of emotional prayer before the Lord. Where they're not hiding like the hypocrites behind fancy words. They don't have the formula mapped out. They don't say the things that sound wise. He is broken before God, or he is deeply thankful before the Lord, or he is at an utter loss as to what to do. And it's in these moments that David records his prayers for us to read in Psalms. There is an authentic emotional reality to praying. Jesus starts off with this, how do we pray? We pray authentically. Don't pray like this. Sometimes you see some people pray, you're like, I want to pray like that. And, other time, and sometimes it's really good. And sometimes you're like, hold off, hold the phone. I read Matthew uh, chapter 6, verses 5 through 8 at church the other day. And uh, I'm going to pray with authentic emotion. Jesus gives us some more clues. Where should I pray? Well, there's certainly appropriate times for public prayer. Jesus 
while teaching us how to pray, is publicly praying in front of what scholars believe to be a few thousand people at this Sermon on the Mount. He was definitely not against public prayer, but he was against public prayer for the sake of making yourself feel good because you pray with others. But what he does encourage us to do is to find a place of intimacy with God where we have a private conversation with the Lord. He says, go to your room, lock the door. And every parent's like, amen. <laughs> Put a sound cushion on the other side so you don't hear the knocks. And spend some time with your Heavenly Father. When we take this moment to step away, what we do is we say, God, I actually just want to spend time with you. I don't want to be in the eye of, of the public. I don't want to be with other people so I can get the accolades of, oh my goodness, I love your prayers. They're so nice. And trust me, I've heard many of you pray. They are beautiful. And I'm so thankful for your hearts of prayer. But we have these moments where God invites us into intimacy. To be like, hey, just spend some time with me. If you have a close individual in your life, a spouse, a friend, a child, there are moments where you have public conversations and moments where you just need some private conversation. Where you get to, where the conversation changes a little bit, doesn't it? When the doors are closed or no one's around, and you get to have a different level of conversation. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to in the where. He says, go find a place of quietness with the Lord. And let's pray and speak. I like this. Do not keep on babbling. My wife um, actually references that to me regularly. Um, she's like, hey, have you read Matthew 6, 7 lately? Because I feel like you're babbling. Uh -huh. When we pray, it is both important to speak, but also to be silent. To be able to have an opportunity to say, God, I'm here, and I want to listen to what you have to say. In the book of Samuel, there is one of my favorite prayers that is my go-to regular uh, if you want to use the word liturgy, style of prayer, Samuel declares this. He says, speak, O God, for your servant is listening. And I think that that is just such a beautiful moment of intimacy, and you have to follow it up with silence. You, right? You don't go to your spouse, you're like, tell me what's on your mind, and then talk for the next 10 minutes. And so when I come before the Lord in these moments, and I go, speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening, the, the next response is silence, to listen. But Matt, does God audibly speak to you? And if so, is it just because you're a pastor? I had a great conversation the other day. Went out to our lunch with a friend. Individual pulled us aside. Said, hey, I was out with a pastor friend. And they're like, you're a pastor. And my friend was like, so is he. And he's like, oh my goodness, please tell me, like, how can I get the Lord to speak to me like he speaks to you? And we're like, yes, it doesn't really work that way. Like, God speaks to all of us. And, and so it's not like a formula. It's not because I have this, uh, this word pastor in front of my name because of a vocation that I have. Like, it is just an invitation. God invites each one of us to have a relationship with him that is a two-way communication. Now, in my personal experience, there has been moments where I feel like I've heard uh, maybe maybe an audible voice, but like never an audible voice that made me jump in and scared me, like, oh, someone's in the room with me. I've, I've had friends who have had that experience. For me personally, I have found that in my moments of silently waiting on the Lord's response, I feel a deep sense of peace in a direction. Or I feel like there's words that are being birthed in my heart that I can't really fathom and put together. And so I go, God, like I just wanna, I wanna acknowledge this and I wanna thank you for this and I wanna, I wanna have trust in this, but I also wanna just make sure that this isn't the words of my heart, that I'm just not making things up. I'll tell you one experience that was really cool. Um, I used to work in forestry, so I got my winters off EI ski team. It was awesome. If you don't know what that is, that means you work seasonally and then you buy a winter season's pass to Whitewater and then you just get paid to ski all year. Yeah, it's awesome. And uh, my wife had other plans and she wanted a walk-in closet. So I was building a walk-in closet and I was praying and I was like, God, I don't know what to do about this job. I like it, but um, 
I think you have something else for me. And so as I was praying and swinging hammers and sawing things and putting up drywall and learning all of this, because I'd never done any of it, she was so trusting of me, I just felt like God was speaking to my heart where he said, sit down, pull out your phone. And I was like, yes, Lord. And I sat down, and I pulled out my phone, and I just felt like God said, I love you. I was like, all right, I'm going to type this out. A little love letter from the Lord. Here we go. Began typing, and, and the, this, and I was like, God, what should I do about my job? And he's like, one more season. I was like, yeah, like fall, like winter ESG ski team, and then I'm done. And I just had this like moment of intimacy with the Lord literally in my closet. It was amazing. And in it, I felt like God gave me very uh, intentional steps that would happen over the next few years, and I began to write them down on my Apple Notes, and over the next five years, I began to see that those things happened in the exact succession that the Lord had spoken in this moment of intimacy with me. And it wasn't an audible voice that spoke, but it was this sensation in my heart where the Lord was like, I have a plan for you. And so I want to encourage you in moments of prayer, if you're going to have the boldness to speak the words of Samuel, speak for your servant is listening, I want to encourage you to listen, and not just with your ears, but with the way that the Lord is going to move in your life. I've had a couple of moments like that in my life. I won't say that it happens every single time that I pray. So when I walk into a moment of prayer with the Lord, I go, God, I'm, I'm just expectant of you. You do what you want to do today. We don't, I don't, I, and, and sometimes I still feel miserably at this church where I walk forward with expectations of what I want God to do, and it's not an expectation, it's like a demand at that moment, and then I need to remind myself, oh yeah, I'm not the one who is demanding here. I'm here to meet with the Lord. Jesus in Matthew 6 even reveals um, what we can pray. Our Father, who is in heaven. This is a profound statement. And I'm going to borrow this actually from the Bible study that if you're joining on Thursday night about prayer, I read it in this book. And so I'm going to reveal a little teaser to you. And if you like this, join the Bible study on Thursday night for prayer. But Jesus, in this statement of our Father, who is in heaven, shattered the perception of the disciples he was speaking to and the people who were listening. First off, he called him our, as in a family, not individuals, and then he said father, which put a very intimate and close relationship between us and our creator. There was the sense of praising our creator, and it was like a collective creator, but a personal relationship, and Jesus says, our father. Amen. He goes, you're with me in this. You're with me in this. And then he says, who, who lives in heaven, and he declares the holiness of who God is. When I read this, I like to go, all right, Lord, I'm going to come before you for the thing that has me in absolute awe of you. God, you are so generous in your kindness towards me. Holy is your name. I'm not going to do a super deep dive on the Lord's Prayer today. Excuse me. If you would like a deep dive in the Lord's Prayer, Thursday nights, 6.30 to 8 o'clock here at the church, the next five weeks is where you can deep dive on the Lord's Prayer with us. But this is where Jesus shares what and how to pray. If we go to the next slide, I think I have a couple more things. Yeah, this is so good. Max Licato wrote a book called The Great House of the Lord in 1997. <coughs> And uh, I read this book. This was another book on the Lord's Prayer. And if you have the opportunity to listen, read, or pick up this book, I would highly recommend it. It was one of the first and most transformative moments in my life on a book that presided completely on the word on prayer. And so if you have your phones with you, scribble down The Great House of the Lord by Max Licato. Um, and I would encourage you to read it. He has this quote in here. The power of prayer is not found in the eloquence or plethora of syllables, but rather the power of prayer is found in the one who hears and cares. This one verse stuck with me. I read it in 2008, and this one quote has stuck with me since then. That it is not me in prayer that makes things happen, but it is rather the one who hears and cares, which is the Lord God Almighty. 
And I will tell you, friends, that relieves such a burden off my back that I didn't need the right words or the right number of syllables. Was I babbling? Was I hypocritical? Was I authentic enough? All of that removed with this one quote from Max Licato that was like, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. And so we pray to God the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. We access God the Father through Jesus Christ, and we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Where is this written? In Romans chapter 8. Paul brings about this beautiful reality to us. Because sometimes we go, I just don't even know what to pray. I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't know how to begin. I don't know what to do once I've started. I'm like, yo, Jesus, having a good day? And we, we kind of like lose. We like, we're like, I don't know what to pray. And Romans 8 tells me something absolutely beautiful. It says that when the Holy Spirit is alive inside of us, and be sure with this, that none of us can call upon the name of the Lord without the Holy Spirit's power. So if you desire to pray, the power of the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to do so. This is what Romans 8 says, that even when we have no idea what to speak about, the Holy Spirit will utter through us that our spirit communes with the Spirit of God and speaks in alignment with God's Word. This is a profound reality written in Romans chapter 8. I would encourage you to study it, to think on it, and then to come before times of prayer. And this is where Jesus says, Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's not my will. It's the will of God. So I come before Jesus. I say, God, here I am. I want to see your kingdom advance, and I want to see your will done. And even though I have all my like little side goals and side quests that I kind of want completed, I'll set them aside if it means like your will is being done. And that's a point of submission that we walk through in prayer. It's a time of communication where we go, God. Your ways are higher than our ways. We sang about that this morning. So where you move, I move. Or where you move, I'll move. Where you go, I'll go. When you speak, I'll speak. But that takes some intimacy. It takes a moment of prayer. It takes some time to observe, see, and go where God is going. I want to encourage you to be quick on the lips with prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says rejoice always. And it goes on. Pray continually. Keep going. Is there one more section there? No, we'll stay there. That was beautiful. Thank you, Bruce, for bringing that up so fast. Rejoice always and pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What's God's will for my life? To be in constant communication with the Lord. There it is, written in 1 Thessalonians. Mystery solved. Problem solved. What does this mean? To be quick on the lips with our prayer. When someone comes to you with a prayer request and you're like, I'll pray about it later. I've done that twice already this morning and I had a moment to pray with people and I said, I'll do that later. Foolish Matt, I repent and I am sorry to those who I did that to and I have not forgotten it and I will pray about those things very shortly. <laughs> but what we see is that there is this reality in 1 Thessalonians where it's like pray continuously and you're like yeah but I have conversations to have with my spouse how can I pray continuously and it's having this recognition that we have direct access to the Lord at all times text message has been incredible for this for understanding this concept before text message you had to like be at home with this like rotary thing and you needed to know how to use it and then the other person needed to be at home and that was how you connected and when called people but now we have this like wild thing called text message i don't even need to use my thumbs i just talk to siri and siri sends text messages now and so what that's done is that's actually helped form and my understanding of what it means that i can pray continuously that at any moment during my day i have an opportunity to be quick with my lips to go to Jesus about whatever is going on. And I want to challenge you to do the same thing. To think about these things. When something comes up, it's a habit that we form to pray regularly. I have some tips on prayer that we'll bring up here. Celebrating the small steps. First off, when we're, steps, when we're walking into a time of prayer, maybe you haven't prayed before, maybe you're new to the whole prayer thing, 
Maybe you're regular in the prayer thing and you're looking and you're like, I feel like there's more. I want to encourage you to celebrate the small little steps that you have. When my wife and I, before we started dating, I celebrated when I learned to spell her name right. I don't celebrate that anymore. But I celebrated it then. When I, when I typed out all the letters without any mistakes and I sent that text and then I hugged the toilet bowl wondering if I needed to throw up if she would respond. <laughs> True story. She responded. So thankful. We had to I had to celebrate these small little steps along the way of the journey to marriage. In the same vein, we want to celebrate the small steps we take in our faith. Hey, I've never prayed before and I don't know how. Hey, begin where you are. God, I've never prayed before and I don't know how. What a great place to start. Let's celebrate this. That's a moment of prayer. I get to run a preteen group on Tuesday nights. And we do this thing called popcorn prayer where I'm like, God, thank you so much for these students. Uh, would you listen to our prayer requests? And then one by one, these students start popcorning like they pop. Get it? With prayer. And we get to hear some of those most theologically ridiculous prayers, but we also get to hear some of the most intimate moments of these students' lives as they begin to, the, for the first time, express something to God. Celebrate the small steps. Begin where you are. Pray with authentic emotion. You do not need to hide your fears, your hesitations, your angers before the Lord. All of them, he, emotions are created things. Uh, how we use them is usually where we find great issue. But bring your emotion, your authentic emotion before the Lord. There is authentic reality with prayer where you have moments of great ecstasy and moments of great depression. And we see both of them in the Psalms and both of them, Jesus prays in anguish and he prays in compassion. So pray with authentic emotion. Pray in patterned behaviors. This might be at meal times. It might be before you leave the house. It might be before bed. It might be before your feet touch the ground. Maybe it's reciting a prayer found from Scripture like the Lord's Prayer or Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Maybe it's using a prayer book to help lead, guide, and direct you in what it looks like to build a devotion life of prayer. These pattern behaviors become things that define the direction we're moving. And when we have a habit of prayer, we will have a habit of God's um, work done in our lives, strengthening our faith. I, I've already said this, but uh, encouraging you to read the Psalms out loud. That, that is such a beautiful thing. And, and read it with some emotion. Scared your kids a little bit as you read it at the dinner table. Like you go to like Psalm 46 where it's like God's talk. David's talking about how God bends the bows and shatters the spears and smashes the chariots of war. And you're just like, Argh! you like get a war paint as you're reading it. It's powerful. Those are things kids remember. Those are things you remember. Get in the habit of reading scripture out loud, of praying regularly. You can even learn to pray out loud in your prayer closet. You can learn to pray with others, for others, alongside one another, for people, for wisdom, for praise. These are all things that we can pray for. Prayer is like a muscle that needs to be exercised. It's awkward at first, I get it. You're like, am I just talking to the ethereal nothing? Do I walk around talking to myself, pretending I have earbuds in, but really I don't, and I'm just praying all day? These are questions that we wrestle with. I get it. I've been there, and sometimes I'm still there. I'm like, God, are you even listening today? And I get all sassy. And he's like, why don't you just go eat something and calm down? I'm like, yeah, good idea. <laughs> Exercising this beautiful invitation of intimacy with the Lord. Learning how we communicate with God. And it might look slightly different person to person. That's okay. Maybe some of you have a hunger and the capacity to pray for hours on end. And maybe for some of you, a minute is like a super long time. That's okay. Celebrate those things. Spend time exercising that muscle of faith. Daily doing this because it will empower health in our lives. Spiritually and physically. There are so many moments, especially at night, 
This is nighttime prayers for me are usually like, God, this is all the things that are in my brain that I haven't solved. Uh, can I just give them to you for the next eight hours while I sleep? And then you just give me back whatever you think you need, I need to deal with tomorrow. That, that has become like almost a pattern prayer in my life because I'm like, like the six cups of coffee that I had this morning, they'll still be working at 11 o'clock tonight. And I don't need that. So I give that to Jesus in prayer. And I say, God, would you just help me pick up what's important at the end of this? So I hope I've encouraged you in moments of prayer, maybe in regular, consistent times of prayer, patterns or habits that you can pray with your spouse or kids. Maybe if your kids have left the house, maybe a regular time frame where you pray for your kids. Jot down, have a notebook by the phone, and when they call and tell you things, jot those down as a prayer request and then pray over them. Ask them about it a week later. Hey, how'd that exam go? They're like, oh, you remembered I had an exam? Not only did I remember, I prayed for you. That's powerful, friends. It opens up a beautiful life, beautiful opportunity to align ourselves with the Lord.